Uh, I would like to thank uh, TU Darmstadt, and I would like to thank uh, Global Climate Change for putting the hot back into hot pets, <laughs> particularly during lunch. I hope everyone's had a good meal. So I'll, we'll try to keep everyone awake. This is the, uh, as you digest, this is talk is about the responsibility of open standards in the era of surveillance. I'm sure, uh, raise your hand here if you have participated in either the IETF or W3C. Okay, not so bad. Uh, raise the hand here if you have no idea, if you never have, if you've implemented an open standard. Okay, a bit more. Uh, raise your, your hand if you've been traumatized by working with the standards body. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Looks like that's the majority vote. Okay, so we're going to kind of talk about this. Uh, I hope we have lots of questions. So uh, one question is, what is an open standard? And a lot of people say, oh, these standards bodies are, you know, what, why do you even need it? Um, well, I think to understand why uh, open standards are important, it's, it's important to understand it, what open actually means. So it has quite a few different definitions. Um, but you have to remember, it's open standards are in contrast to closed standards. So how many people here have ever had to do very low-level SQL implementation? OK. And then you have to realize that you have to like pay to download a SQL spec. And you go to BitTorrent because you're looking for a SQL spec. And no one's seeding the SQL specs. Um, so, so actually, what happens is that uh, traditionally, believe it or not, uh, standards happen in closed environments with voting and nation states. And it was you know, very little input or input from engineers who may have not been the best. Uh, and so the, the, the internet and the web after that said, well, well, we should have open standards as an open collaborative process. We should get wide review uh, from the planet. Um, and the one thing that standards actually do quite well, I think it's inarguable, is we uh, give names and numbers to things that everyone's already doing. Um, so you, know, you say, oh, I want to do HMAC. What do you really mean? How are you doing it? Well, there's a spec, has a number. You can read, you know, if it's well written, understand what's going on. Uh, we ideally, although it's hit and miss, provide interoperability testing. So if someone implements a spec and you implement a spec, they should interoperate. Um, and then there's a bunch of legal stuff, which we're also going to touch on. Uh, you know, open standards present, prevent companies from being accused of antitrust. And they have, depending on the standards body, some amount of patent protections. That's what an open standard is. Uh, it is also an uh, exceptionally slow and painful process. And uh, so there's this great blog post. I, how many people here have read it? OK. Actually, that, well, everyone should read this blog post by none other than Moxie Maron Spike of the Open Whisper Signal team. And he has a very interesting argument. Uh, you know, old friend, he basically argues the ecosystem's moving and that at this point, uh, open standards uh, actually hurt or could hurt deployment. And it's actually a very convincing argument. And I, I think it's worth taking seriously. Um, you know, does extensibility hurt deployment? You can't control what's on the other endpoint. And so XMPP is a sort of classic case of this. The deployment of OTR is a classic case of this inside XMPP. Uh, one of the clear advantages of something like XMPP, if you go back to Dan's talk and his discussion of Signal, uh, is that it is decentralized. You, know, you can have names, identifiers, you can run your own XMPP server, so you can't have jabber.cc.de talk to jabber.org. Uh, but you know, the question is, as the internet centralizes more and more, and as more people are essentially inside of proprietary platforms, is decentralization even a, a, a realistic strategy at this point? And maybe we already got the decentralization we need. You know, everyone has a mobile phone. They have address books. They can move them between Androids and you know, different devices. Maybe that's the portable social graph that we've all been hoping would happen. Um, another you know, biting criticism is that open standards slow down innovation. Right? So you know, if you're stuck in this mailing list talking for three years before you implement, uh, the world may have moved. And now we are in a period, particularly in the app space, where there's lots of really fast innovation. And second thing, you know, there was a theory, and it's still it's true, I think, depending on where you are and what, who you're deploying to, that you, if you want to reach users, I mean, maybe standards is the way to do it. If you want to go through a web browser, unless you're a Brendan Eich, you're like, I'll just make a new web browser or a fork one. If you want to put stuff in existing web browsers, you have to go through open standards. But that may not be the case. If you have certain market sectors, you know, Gmail for email, WhatsApp, for example, messaging, that maybe it makes more sense just to deploy the protocol at the key points where there's already millions, if not in WhatsApp's case, in Gmail, billions of users. So 
Um, we're gonna try, I'm going to, I think all those points are, are serious, and they are true uh, to an extent, but I think there's also a case to be made uh, for defending and working on open standards. And by the end of this talk, we're going to try to get to the, the point of not only do we know when we should work on a standard, but we can also explain uh, uh, when your technology X, your crazy new mixed networking thing or whatever you're working on, is ready for standardization. Uh, so the Internet Engineering Task Force is a sort of granddaddy of open standards. Uh, it's ran depending on how you feel about it. If you're against it, it's a cabal of people with gray beards. If you, it is open, though, so it has been compared by, uh, for example, certain governments to an anarcho-hippie commune, and they're very unhappy with how open it is. Um, in reality, it's uh, a bunch of people on mailing lists who have quarterly meetings, and they have a process where more or less anyone can write an informational draft and then you know, through a lot of work and a lot of discussion, a lot of review, particularly by the Internet Architecture Board, you can get to an Internet standard. Uh, this year, rather unfortunately, uh, it was conflicting with PETS. We have uh, notified the ITF, who plans their meetings out several years in advance, that all the folks in Berlin should have been at PETS, and by some of us should have been there. And so that this uh, conflict will not happen in the future. And one of the nice things about the Internet Engineering, Engineering Task Force is they do have mandatory uh, Security considerations, privacy is still. You know, they're trying. Everyone's trying to understand what that actually would mean. Um, now, of course, I mean one of the problems with the IETF. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of people here have had uh, spent most of their lives uh, trying to figure out why uh, IETF standards are so terrible uh, from a security <laughs> uh, standpoint and how to fix that. So yeah, you know, I just I just outlined when the IETF RFCs were published for non-encrypted and encrypted versions of the same thing. As you can see, there was you know, sort of 10, if not more, a year gap between most of the basic protocols which form the internet as, and the web as we know it today and uh, the standards themselves. So it's kind of interesting to look at timing. You know, new directions of cryptography and all this sort of came out at the same time or a little bit right after TCP IP was sort of fleshed out. And Vince Cerf kind of said off the cuff in a Google Hangout, yeah, you know, working with the National Security Agency and design of a secured version of the internet, but it was classified, so I couldn't share it. So therefore, uh, we all got unencrypted protocols that we then had to spend a lot of time fixing. So that's from Vint. So as you can see, uh, you know, Vint, that's otherwise known as the architect, uh, and other people have been working a very long time trying to encrypt the net. I think post Snowden, um, there's been some victory. So the other standards body, which is kind of a fork to some extent of IETF, uh, is W3C. W3C deals with web standards, directed by Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the web. Uh, it has, and the, some of the advantages of W3C over, let's say, IETF, a lot of people complain IETF is a very fuzzy process. It's unclear really when you, where you go. There's no timing. Things get stuck there for years. Uh, W3C actually, when it makes a new standard, it says we will deliver standard within X years or we kill the working group. I think it's a good thing. Um, it has, if you think the working group's doing something that you really don't like, there's a formal process for formally objecting. Uh, it uses GitHub now, at least, so that's great. You know, really increasing the productivity. Uh, W3C has uh, interoperability requirements, so standards which have normative parts, which I hope your standard does has to prove that they have more than one implementation, that those implementations are interoperable via a test suite. Um, of course, while it is focused on web browsers, you know, and we've done, I think, a fair amount of decent security work, which we'll go into in a bit, uh, you know, there's also, there's a little bit of confusion, so there's also what we G. So at a certain point, W3C, uh, rather unfortunately, thought XML was the future of the web, and uh, the web browser windows went off and did uh, what became HTML5. Now it's kind of reincorporated back in, but if you really want the latest kind of implementer version of HTML core, uh, what we do tends to maintain those specs a little bit closer. So this is what a spec looks like, if you haven't seen one. Uh, this is probably the most exciting one uh, we have right now. So everyone hates passwords. And at some point, uh, web authentication, which comes out of this guy. I can't pronounce his last name. Alexi, University of Washington. That is the PhD thesis, mixed with a lot of work from Dirk Balfans and other folks, uh, basically sort of saying, hey, we can actually do one-factor crypto authentication with uh, origin-derived credentials in a safe way that we believe at least doesn't uh, have the same crypto credential being repeated between providers. Very simple challenge response protocol. Uh, it will be in all browsers. It started last year. It will be in all browsers by end of the year. Right? So this is Microsoft. Everyone to Apple. Apple has Touch ID. 
refer to biometrics later, but we have, you know, things, standards can happen fast, they can happen quick. This comes from the FIDO space. Uh, that, but again, there's still concerns. For example, uh, on this spec, there's a concern that maybe the user's credential is cryptographically fine, but however, let's say I want to see, are you using a YubiKey or, or are you using a certain kind of biometric? How the, the, there's another bit of spec that's about testing the kind of device you have. So if everyone's device has a unique ID, then it essentially <laughs> defeats all of the privacy considerations for the sort of user-based key material, right? So there, there's, it needs more, it, we need privacy researchers looking at our specs uh, and it's becoming more popular to publish papers on them. Uh, patents are very different between IETF and W3C. IETF has a note well process, so you have to disclose patents if you know about them, but then occasionally this leads to email lists where people are claiming they can't read emails and you know, it gets really weird really fast. Uh, W3C uh, is not quite as anarchic as IETF, but it comes with a nice advantage because W3C is a consortium composed of members. Uh, one of the nice things about W3C spec is the members, you know, all the way up to the top of the corporation and the patent lawyers commit to licensing relevant patents that they may have under royalty-free licensing. So on some level, this is sort of patent war chest-ish effect from W3C. Uh, and you know, given all the mess we've had for decades over crypto patents, I do think that one of the advantages of standards is just helping sort those out. Uh, of course, you know, the wonderful thing about standards bodies, there's so many to choose from. Uh, so there's the ITU, we want to talk about the closed standard process we mentioned earlier, but you know, they, they have some things they do quite well. Uh, open standards try to define themselves using this open stand manifesto. And then there's this mysterious world of internet governance, which to my, which kind of seems to be mostly about making money out of DNS. Um, and which of course ran by ICANN, civil society, goes to the internet governance forum, and then you have kind of like local internet governance forum things in Europe, you have some Europeans here, you have Eurodig. Um, so I just want to bring up a few points of good things that, that standards bodies have done. So ITF is now, you know, has recognized mass surveillance as attack, pervasive monitoring as attack. They're, they're reversing the traditional crypto flow from NSA, NIST NSA to the community, and you're seeing developer open source stuff from the open source community, Curve 25519 from DJB, being worked on as standards being put in a TLS, and you're also seeing human rights considerations, the IRTF human rights considerations protocols, and not only gonna have secure reviews, but you may even have human rights reviews of protocols. Uh, but you also have bad things, right? W3C, doing great work to defend against cross-site scripting attacks at the same time, Claudia and friends discovered the battery API privacy leak, WebRTC busting VPNs, emails from coming from Iranian human rights activists who are saying, please, you know, we're being tracked using WebRTC. It's busting our VPN and engineers saying, we don't like this as well, but our management is telling us that it's more important for corporate users to make local phone calls over IP on their VPN, uh, using a VPN than defend human rights activists. And so in the most perhaps uh, big one right now, DRM, encrypted media extensions, so digital rights management, uh, being put already in everyone's browser via more or less a silent update unless you've torn it out and it will become an official standard by September. And so what we've asked people to do uh, is that, you know, we've asked people to get involved and interestingly enough, EFF got involved and they put forward a petition to basically say we can protect security researchers using um, something like the W3C's royalty free patent policy. So thanks. Ian and everyone here for signing this, but basically, can we, even if DRM goes in the browsers, can we make it such that users and security researchers are not hurt by anti-circumvention laws? Uh, that would be great if we could use standards to make that happen. Um, but then, you know, everyone really likes to watch Netflix, even if they complain. And then uh, we've had street protests over this, uh, but I do recommend that you read the W3C's response. And lastly, uh, I want to point out that I do think it's time that working with standards have become a little bit more political. When all the open standards was sort of forming and there was fights over the future of the internet, the ITU, people forget we had protests in 2003 by civil society who felt there were being human rights like this being pushed out of standards. That standards are actually a place where not only do we have to design 
protocols, and there's all these open issues here, but we actually have to understand that the effects that we have through protocols can influence billions of people. And that essentially, when we stare at this, we have to take this into account and do it carefully. That's why the process is slow. And you know, we apologize if the process goes horribly wrong sometimes, but we do think it's a worthwhile process for mature ideas to go through. My definition of what makes a mature idea is that you have a number, if you have a number of different open source or closed source code bases that are doing more or less the same thing, you have actual products with users. And some of these users could be in very high risk areas. And you want to increase the deployment and you want to really go through and make sure the privacy and security concerns are correct. And you want to make sure there's no patent concerns, you should go through a standards process. However, uh, there's so much you could standardize. Key discovery, secure messaging, blockchain areas of MMS, software updates. And there's a lot of, you know, there's new things to standardize, but we also desperately need you to help defend old standards, TLS 1.3, open PGP, web authentication, DRM, human rights considerations, just monitoring the cryptographers and the crypto research forum. We don't have enough independent, neutral academics, particularly those sticking up for human rights, working in these areas. So here's some links, and I do think that essentially the response uh, to uh, my good friend Moxie should be yes, standards do not mean instant success. Yes, it can hurt deployment. However, there's certain points when it's necessary and it can help. And really what makes a standards process work or not work is not the process, it's not the magic number. It, there's absolutely no magic. It really is just about people. Just like pets is about people and just like you know, any ultimate process is about the quality of the people involved. And right now, as someone on the inside, I can say we need more quality people right now. So I'm hoping next year we don't collocate over ITF and we get more of this community over there. Thanks a lot.